All right, engineers, in this video, we're gonna go over external respiration continuously, but we're gonna talk specifically in this video about partial pressure gradients and solubilities. If you guys haven't already, go and watch the uh, video on ventilation and perfusion, and then the one on thickness, air, uh, thickness and surface area of the respiratory membrane. Now we're gonna talk about partial pressure gradients and solubilities. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm just kind of making, you know, let's imagine here I take a piece of the lung, you know, where we had that diagram where we had the alveoli like this, and then we had the actual pulmonary capillaries that were serving it. All I'm doing is, is I'm expanding on that. So I'm just taking this diagram and we're blowing up the alveola and blowing up the pulmonary capillary so we can make everything really nice and clear. Okay, so if you guys already know, you understand that there's some type of uh, gas accumulation in this actual alveoli. There's a lot of different gases in this alveoli. We'll talk about that when we talk about partial pressures in a little bit more detail with respect to Dalton's law. But for right now, I want to talk about two main gases, okay? One of the main ones that you guys have already understood by now is that there's going to be a lot of oxygen in this area, right? Because if you understand that there's actually going to be oxygen coming from where? Oxygen is going to be coming from the atmosphere, right? It's going to be coming from the atmosphere. You know the atmosphere, generally the partial pressure of oxygen moving in during the inspiration process, during the inspiration process, is generally about 160 millimeters of mercury. So the air that's coming from the atmosphere, right, the air that's coming from the atmosphere is generally about 160 millimeters of mercury with oxygen, right, with respect to oxygen. When it flows in though, it really only flows into a certain point. And that point in which it actually stops is when the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveola is approximately 104 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli is approximately 104 millimeters of mercury. But when it's coming in from the actual atmosphere via the inspiration process, it's coming in at about 160 millimeters of mercury. Now, if we take, for example, what about the CO2? Well, if you guys remember, I did say that CO2 was also present in here. And if you guys remember, I said CO2 was being exhaled. We were getting rid of the CO2 into the atmosphere, right? Now, CO2 in the uh, actual alveoli is, you know, it's a lot lower. It's generally about a partial pressure of, so the partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli is approximately 40 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so approximately about 40 millimeters of mercury for the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. But there is other different types of molecules in here. We're not gonna talk too much about them, but understand that there is nitrogen. Nitrogen is actually one of the most abundant atoms inside of the alveoli. However, it's not really contributing to the gas exchange process. And there is even water in here. Okay, there's a little bit of water. We'll talk about that with respect to surface tension. Now, we understand the partial pressures of oxygen in the alveoli. We understand the partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli. The question is now, what is the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood coming to the actual pulmonary capillaries? And what is the partial pressure of CO2 that's coming through the blood via the pulmonary capillaries? And that is what we need to think about. So, okay, where would this blood be coming from? Where would this blood be coming from? If we were to be really particular, you know this blood is coming from specifically, you know, it's coming from the right ventricle. So your right ventricle is pumping blood into the pulmonary arteries. And then these pulmonary arteries are basically feeding this, this actual pulmonary capillary. Now the question is, what kind of blood is coming from the right side of the heart? That's the real question. Well, the right side of the heart is mainly carrying deoxygenated blood. So very, very deoxygenated blood. So low, uh, low oxygen, but high CO2 concentration or partial pressures. So if that's the case, then we should expect the oxygen partial pressure to be pretty low in this area. And we should expect the partial pressure of CO2 to be a little bit higher than what it is in the alveoli. Okay, well, let's, let's write that down then. Here's what it is. The partial pressure of oxygen is approximately in resting tissues, in resting, because we'll talk about it whenever there's activity. But in resting tissues, it's about 40 millimeters of mercury. Okay, that's the actual partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. And let's actually denote this with B for blood, okay? And let's put up, up here A for alveoli, okay? So now the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood is about 40 millimeters of mercury. The partial pressure of CO2 though we said is higher. Um, what would you think? Oh, people would be like, oh, maybe it's like 104. No, not even close. The partial pressure of CO2 
is only 45 to 46 millimeters of mercury. Let's go with 45 though. It's about 45 to 46 millimeters of mercury, okay? Now if that's the case, and again, this is the partial pressure of CO2 in the blood, and then this is the partial pressure of CO2 within the alveoli, okay? Look at the difference. You know, uh, according to laws, you know, there's different laws of diffusion or, or movement of gases in, in situations like that, that generally when something is in higher concentration, so let's say that there's oxygen here, you know, and there's a lot of oxygen in this position, let's say I have a semi-permeable membrane here. Here's my semi-permeable membrane, and I have very little oxygen in this area. This one's gonna have a higher pressure of oxygen, this one's gonna have a lower pressure of oxygen. Generally, things like to move from areas of high pressure to low pressure via through this what? Through this semi-permeable membrane. It's gonna wanna move from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. That's what's gonna happen here. Look at the gradient difference in oxygen. It's 104 millimeters of mercury versus 40. That's a steep partial pressure gradient. So generally, oxygen, which is coming out from the atmosphere into this area, which is going to be very plentiful, is going to want to move from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. So that's what's going to want to happen. Oxygen here, let's say here's our oxygen, he's going to want to move from the actual alveoli into the blood. That's what he's going to want to do. So a lot of oxygen is going to move from the alveoli and into the blood. At the same time, though, you're like, oh, well, CO2 it's a 45 to 40 difference. That's only a five millimeter mercury difference. This one's almost like 80, right? I'm sorry, this one's almost like 60 millimeter mercury difference. So this one right here, 104 versus 40, that's like a 60 millimeter mercury difference. 45 to 40 is only five. This is where people would make the most common mistake and say, oh, there must not be equal amounts of gases being exchanged because the pressure gradient difference here is so huge and this one's very, very little. Well, remember, we're not just talking about partial pressures. We're talking about solubilities also. You know there's a law. It's called Henry's Law. Henry's Law states that the solubility, so we're going to say solubility, of a gas is dependent upon the rate of the gas. Okay, so the rate constant of this specific gas multiplied by the pressure. So multiplied by pressure. So in other words, if you think about this relationship, if I increase the pressure of a gas, I'm gonna increase the solubility of that gas in a fluid. So in other words, CO2 is gonna act like our gas, right? And this is our fluid. When I have an increase in pressure, okay, if I increase the pressure, it's gonna increase the solubility of that gas in the fluid. CO2 is 20 times, how many times? CO2 is 20 times more soluble in this actual blood plasma and the alveolar fluid as compared to oxygen. So he is 20 times more soluble. So because he is 20 times more soluble than the oxygen, even though there's not a steep gradient, there's still going to be equal amount of gases being exchanged. And again, where would CO2 be going? He'd still be going from high concentration to low concentration. But also remember, its solubility is playing a huge role in this. Okay, it's 20 times more soluble in the plasma and in the alveolar fluid. So where's the CO2 gonna go? These amounts of CO2 are gonna go from the blood to the alveoli. This is the, the simplest definition of external respiration. If you have to remember the most simplest definition of external respiration, it's the movement of oxygen from the alveoli into the pulmonary blood. It's the movement of CO2 from the pulmonary blood into the alveoli. But if we really want it to be a little bit more technical, we should see what's actually happening to the hemoglobin in this situation. That's what we gotta look at. So now, let's get into in this and start looking at hemoglobin. So if you guys remember, you guys remember hemoglobin, well there's actually adult hemoglobin, let's say that we're looking specifically at hemoglobin A1, which is adult hemoglobin. So there's two alpha chains and two beta chains, right, within iron containing heme group. So let's draw that here. So let's say here, um, let's draw him like this. So let's say here is my heme group right here. Look at him. He's ready to help, okay? Here's my guy here. And then coming off of him, here's my heme group. And coming off of him, I'm gonna have a alpha chain, right? Let's say I have over here, I have a, another alpha chain. Then let's say over here I have a, beta chain, 
and then over here I have a beta chain. So this guy's ready to help out. He wants to do some good stuff. What is he going to do? What is this hemoglobin molecule going to do? Here's our hemoglobin. Now the important thing about hemoglobin is, here's our, our, our heme, right, with the actual globin chains coming off. There should be iron containing heme groups. There should be iron located in this. Let's draw iron here in this actual green. So now, let's say here I have a iron there, okay? You know iron, there's two different states of them. You know there's iron in the three plus state and there's iron within the two plus state. The question is which one of these irons is actually gonna be added in here? It has to be the two plus. We have to actually have in this form, inside of this, inside of the hemoglobin, it has to be in the ferrous form, not in the ferric form. So whenever you have iron here into this actual structure, whenever it's added in, whenever it's in the hemoglobin, it has to be in the two plus form. Okay, so here we should have iron in the two plus form. Here we should have iron in the two plus form. Here we should have iron in the two plus form. Okay, now what's gonna happen? Well, here's what we have to think about. You know, whenever this is, I, I told you, uh, I told you that the blood coming from the right ventricle is specifically going to be deoxygenated blood and high in CO2. Okay, well, let's account for that then. Let's say, just for the heck of it, let's say that there's only one oxygen molecule bound to this hemoglobin. Okay, specifically to the iron containing heme group. But we also have to account for all the CO2. Okay, well, you know that CO2 can be bound on to these actual globin chains? You know, whatever binds onto the globin chains, let's say here we have a globin chain, it can bind onto the globin chain. It can bind onto the globin chain. You know when it's bound onto these globin chains? Let's say it's bound onto this one here too. So let's say it's bound onto these globin chains. Specific amino acids in the globin chains will bind the CO2. That type of CO2 right there is called carboaminohemoglobin. Okay? Again, what is this type of CO2 here called? It's called carba amino hemoglobin. Out of the CO2 that's being transported from the tissues to the alveoli, 20% of it exists in this form. Okay, 20% of it. So out of the CO2 that you're going to find in this whole blood area, 20% of it is going to be found in this form, the carboaminohemoglobin form. Okay, well where's the other significant, you know, 80%? Okay. We'll talk about how we actually make this in a little, and you're gonna see a little bit of it. But most of the CO2, 70% of the CO2, is gonna be found in the form of, let's actually bring him over here. Let's actually bring him over here. Bicarbonate. Oh, that's cool. So 70%, how much 70% of my CO2 is gonna be hidden in the form of bicarbonate? And we'll see exactly how that's meant to, you know, how that, what, what explains that process. Okay, we got 20% of the CO2 is in the form of carbamine hemoglobin, 70 to about 75% in the form of bicarbonate. Where's the remaining like 10%? Okay, the remaining 10%, about two to 10% is actually dissolved within the blood plasma. So the remaining, the remaining CO2 is actually just dissolved here in the blood plasma. So it's just dissolved. So let's put that dissolved, okay? So this is gonna be about, we say on average about they say two to 10%. Okay, so it's a kind of different range. Okay, so 20% is in the form of carbamine hemoglobin. It's bound to the globin chains. So you know this is a globin chain? Globin chains are just proteins, they're made up of amino acids. CO2 can be bound onto certain amino acids and form carboamino hemoglobin. CO2 can also be hidden in the form of bicarbonate, and I'll explain what I mean by that. And then about two to 10% of it is dissolved within the blood plasma. Now, this hemoglobin is said to be what's called deoxyhemoglobin. So this whole hemoglobin is said to be what's called deoxyhemoglobin. What does that mean? It means it's not oxygenated. So this is said to be deoxyhemoglobin. You know in biochemistry they say deoxyhemoglobin is particularly in the T state. So it's in the T state, which is the taut state, if it's in the deoxy form, meaning it's really, really bound to a lot of CO2, very, very little oxygen. Now, one other thing. It's not just bound to oxygen. You know what else? And it's not just bound to CO2. It's also bound to something really uh, special also. You know there's protons, which are gonna be coming in this area too. We have a lot of protons. So here's another proton. You know there's specific amino acids, amino acids like aspartic acid and glutamic acid. And those amino acids have negative charges. 
So let's say here's an amino acid here and it has negative charges. If these are negative charges, it's going to interact with these protons. It's going to hook the protons. If you hook onto these protons, it's going to hold the protons there also. So, so far, what is this hemoglobin bound to? Let's kind of put a little tally here. This T state hemoglobin, or deoxyhemoglobin, so let's put T state or deoxy hemoglobin, what is he bound to at this point in time? He's bound to very little oxygen, very, very little oxygen. Okay, so he has a very, very low affinity for oxygen. What else is he bound to? He's bound to a lot of CO2 in the form of carbamine hemoglobin. He's also in the form of bicarbonate in the blood plasma. And he's also in the form of dissolved CO2. And he's also bound on to protons. You know, that's not all he's bound on to. There's something else really, really interesting. Look at this guy here. You see the space right here? He's got a lot of negative, he's got a lot of positive charged surfaces in here. Okay, and what happens is there's a lot of you know histidine and, and even um, arginine and lysine. They're positively charged amino acids. In this pocket, there's a special molecule sitting in there. Look at them. This guy is called 2 comma 3 BPG. 2 comma 3 BPG is 2 comma 3 bisphosphoglycerate. It's a product from glycolysis within the red blood cells. This can come in here and it can stick into this pocket here. When it sticks into this pocket with these positively charged amino acids, it helps to stabilize this hemoglobin in the T state form. Okay, so now what is actually bound onto this T state um, hemoglobin? He's bound to very little oxygen, he's bound to a lot of CO2, he's bound to a lot of protons, and he's bound to a lot of 2, 3 BPG. All right, cool. That's what we have so far. So, so far we know it's bound to protons, we know it's bound to CO2, we know it's bound to 2, 3 BPG, and it's bound to very little oxygen. And it's called deoxyhemoglobin, or it's the T-state hemoglobin. Sweet. Now we have to display one more thing, and then we can see how this gas exchange is affecting. This hemoglobin, it's affinity. So let's, just, let's, determine, let's use this term affinity. You know, affinity is you know, how much you want something, how much you want to be with that thing. Hemoglobin, he's kind of like, he's not really monogamous. He wants to have two different people that he really likes. One of them is CO2 and the other one's oxygen. So in this T state, so let's say hemoglobin here, in this T state, T hemoglobin, what's its affinity for oxygen? Well, it doesn't really have a lot of oxygen bound to it. So there's a low affinity. So in the T state, or I'll put again deoxy state, what is happening with this actual oxygen? It has a decreased oxygen affinity. Well, who does it have a lot of affinity for? Well, it wants to bind a lot of CO2, it wants to bind a lot of protons, it wants to bind a lot of 2 comma 3 BPG. But usually in certain texts, we don't really include the protons in a 2 comma 3 BPG. We really just say he has a lot of uh, affinity for the CO2. So he has high CO2 affinity. But for the sake of it, we're going to also say he has high proton affinity. And he's stabilized by, stabilized by 2 comma 3 BPG in this T state or this deoxy state. Now, this situation in which there's a decreased oxygen affinity, there's an increased CO2 affinity, increased H plus affinity, and stabilized by 2 comma 3 BPG. Look what happens. Oxygen is in such high concentration here in the alveoli. And he is in very, very low concentration here in the actual blood and within the hemoglobin. So where is oxygen going to want to move? It's going to want to move from areas of high pressure to low pressure because it has an extremely steep gradient. So it's going to start flying through from the alveoli and into the blood. When it does, it binds onto these iron-containing heme pockets. Now i got to talk about one more thing. i got to talk about what's called cooperativity or positive cooperativity. So best way I found one of my professors to teach me was like this. I have a hemoglobin here. Let's say it has four pockets, okay? Four pockets here. It's already bound to one oxygen right now. So it's already bound to one oxygen. When another oxygen comes in and binds, let's say that a second oxygen, so let's say this is the first oxygen, let's say this is the second oxygen. The second oxygen comes in and binds. When the second oxygen comes in and binds, look what happens to the actual shape of this hemoglobin. So this is our hemoglobin, okay? Look what happens, okay?
Whoa. Oxygen bound, oxygen bound. Look at the size of that pocket. That's a big frecker. What's going to happen now? The next oxygen that's going to be coming in from the alveoli into this blood, it's going to have a huge space to bind onto. But then look what happens again. When that oxygen, so this is the third oxygen that binds on. Look what happens again afterwards. And again, this is our hemoglobin. Look at this. Okay, normal, normal, normal. Whoa, it got even bigger. So now this pocket was big there. Look at it now, it's, it's gargantuous. And this fourth oxygen, it's gonna be even easier for him to add on to. So here's the point. Whenever oxygen starts moving from the alveoli into the blood and binding onto hemoglobin, when it binds on, let's say that the second one binds on. When the second one binds on, it opens up a pocket for the third one to bind on. But it's even easier for the third one to bind on. Then when the third one binds on, it opens up the fourth pocket and makes it gargantuous. There's no way that oxygen is going to miss that pocket. He's going to hit it perfectly. This is by definition the concept of positive cooperativity. So what is this called again? This is called positive cooperativity. Okay, it's just easier. Every oxygen that's added on, it's easier for the, each oxygen to be added on in sequence. So the first oxygen is a little harder, second one's a little easier, third one's a lot easier, and the fourth one is the easiest. Okay, that's it. So in that case then, let's imagine now that this oxygen is going to come over here and bind to this actual guy here. So now we're going to come over here and we're going to just, that way it's nice and clean. Let's see what's all happening now. Okay, so that oxygen, it's moving, right? It's moving from the partial pressure of oxygen was about 104, right? And it was 40 here. It's going to start moving from this area into this area. And again, what was this partial pressure of oxygen? The partial pressure of oxygen in this area was about 40 millimeters of mercury. So again, let's draw our hemoglobin and look what starts happening now. Here's our hemoglobin. We're going to make him a little bigger because he's going to be happy to see the oxygen. Okay, so look what happens here. That's actually, you know, for right now, we're gonna, he's going to have no face. But you guys know that he's happy. He's ready to help. Okay, so again, what happens here? What is he going to have bound to him? Well, he's going to have two alpha chains. Here's an alpha. Here's an alpha chain. You also know that it's going to have two beta chains. So here's a beta chain, and here is a beta chain. And then you remember that it's also going to have those positive charges right here. And then it was going to be bound in there by 2 comma 3 BPG. So 2, 3 BPG was bound in this pocket. And then you also remember that we had iron here in the center in the 2 plus state. And originally it was only bound to, we said, one oxygen. So let's say it was only bound in this case to one oxygen. But then you guys understand the concept now. Watch what's going to happen. Oxygen is going to move from areas of high concentration to low concentration. It's going to come in, and this is the second oxygen that's going to bind. It's going to bind onto this iron. Boom. He, uh, he gets added. Okay? So he adds to the iron containing heme group here. Here's already present in this one. So that's the second one. The second one gets added. What, is that, what did I just tell you about positive cooperativity? It's going to change its shape in such a way where the third one, it gets added even easier. So now let's say another oxygen comes over here, and it binds onto this site. So now that's the third oxygen that gets added. Well, if the third oxygen gets added to this iron, then what do I say? Oh, well, the fourth one's going to be even easier. There's no way that that oxygen can miss it. So it changes its shape in such another way that it gets another oxygen added. Okay. But now that I've added here, how many oxygens have I added? I've added one, two, three, four oxygens to this hemoglobin molecule. Okay? Here's what hemoglobin says. Before he was like liking CO2 and liking the protons and he was being stabilized by the 2 comma 3 BPG. But then he sees oxygen and he's like, mmm, she good, I like her. What is he going to do? He's going to hold on to the oxygen and say, okay, CO2, protons, 2 comma 3 BPG, I don't need you anymore. Get away. So now look what happens here. When the oxygen binds on to this iron containing heme site, it changes its shape in such a way where look, you see these positive charges? They're no longer exposed. Let's say originally his, his legs were like that. Look, now they're closed. <laughs> he's he's got to go to the bathroom, whatever. But you see how he's, he's, he's pinching his legs now. So this actual 2, 3 BPG, there's still positive charges here, right? 
but that 2 comma 3 BPG can't get in there to it. So it can't stabilize this guy anymore in the T state. So look, 2 comma 3 BPG is trying to get in there, but boom, he's getting blocked. Okay, because of the change in the conformational structure of hemoglobin. Because when it binds onto oxygen, it changes its overall shape, which blocks the 2 comma 3 BPG from binding into those positively charged pockets. Next thing, CO2, we said, is actually very, very soluble in the alveolar fluid, right? So it's going to want to move into that area. So what do we have before? We said we had 20% of the CO2 here in this form. So look, here's our CO2 now. This CO2, which was in the 20% form of carbamine hemoglobin, guess where he's going to go? He's going to start moving into the alveoli from the blood. So from the blood, he's going to move from the blood and into the alveoli. It's just simple diffusion, OK? Then, what else did we say was bound here? We also said that we had a lot of protons bound here, because there was protons bound to negatively charged amino acids, right? Like, you know, like different types of amino acids, like glutamic acid and aspartic acid. They were holding on to that proton. So let's say here's another proton, just for the heck of it. OK, there's a proton. Remember I told you that 70% of the CO2 was hidden in the form of bicarbonate. So look out here. I'm going to have bicarbonate. And again, how much of it is going to be in this form? About 70 to about 75%. Look what happens to this bicarbonate. OK, two things can happen. OK, here's this channel, special channel. This channel is really cool because look what's going to happen. I'm going to sh um, shunt this bicarb in. I'm going to bring the bicarb in. But bicarb is negatively charged. So then the cell is going to become really, really negative. I don't want it to become too negative. So what do I got to do? I got to have something go out because I want to control that significant negative ions coming in. So what am I going to do? I'm going to have something go out. So now this chloride is going out. And why is this chloride going out? Because we have a lot of negative ions coming in. If we have a lot of negative ions coming in, there's going to be too much negative charge on this membrane. It'll change the actual membrane potential. We don't want that. So we're going to get, just push some negative ions out to neutralize that effect. This right here is called the chloride shift. So what is this called? It's called the chloride shift. And again, it's just when the bicarbonate's coming into the actual red blood cell and chloride ions are going out. Now, when the bicarb comes in, look what happens. You see this proton right here? This proton sees that bicarbonate, and he's, so he's bound to hemoglobin right now. Hemoglobin's already said, like, protons, I don't want you. And protons are like, all right, I don't want you either. And he goes over here and binds with the bicarbonate. And look what happens. These protons, they come over here, and they combine with that bicarb now. When these protons combine with the bicarb, we're going to fuse them together. And when we fuse them together, look what we get out as a result. So as a result, I get what's called H2. CO3. This is called carbonic acid. So this right here, this HCO3 negative is called bicarbonate. This right here is called carbonic acid. Now carbonic acid is a weak acid. Bicarbonate is a weak base. But carbonic acid is very unstable. Okay, So he's going to want to break down. So what he does is he disassociates into two molecules. One of them is called, look at this, one of them is called CO2. The other one is water. Okay? Now, here's the thing. This reaction can occur slowly or fast, but it depends. You know, uh, there's it's called enzymes, and enzymes are designed to be able to speed up the rate of a reaction, right? But they don't really, uh, all they do is decrease the activation energy. There's a special enzyme involved in this step. This enzyme is called carbonic anhydrase. Okay, So carbonic anhydrase is this enzyme that is speeding up this reaction and converting carbonic acid into CO2 and water, but this reaction is reversible. So in the same way, CO2 and water can go back to carbonic acid. Now, where does that CO2 go? same area that this CO2 goes. So now look, look where this CO2 is going to go. It's going to go out. And then eventually where would it go? It'll go into the alveoli here. So because we're going to breathe this out. We're going to exhale it out. OK, what about the other CO2? You know, there was about 2 to 10% of the CO2 dissolved over here. So I also had about 2 to 10% of that CO2 just dissolved. Where is it going to go? It's also going to go into the alveoli. 
One more thing I want to mention. You know this reaction that's occurring inside of the cell with the carbonic anhydrase? It also happens out here in the plasma. But you know the problem is? We don't have that enzyme. This enzyme, that carbonic anhydrase, is only found inside of the cell. So look what happens here. Let's say that this bicarbonate, it's all over the plasma. Let's say it's right here. It's going to combine with a proton that's out here in the blood. Because you know you have protons all over. It could be here in the blood plasma just circulating. These two will combine. When these two combine, what happens? They get converted into, again, carbonic acid, H2CO3. H2CO3 gets broken down into um, uh, specifically CO2 and water. And again, remember, H, the bicarbonate is out here. About 70% of it is out here. There is protons always within the actual blood plasma, right? They get converted into carbonic acid, but there is no enzyme in this step. So what does that mean? The CO2 is still going to get formed, right? You're still going to form this CO2, and it's still going to move into the alveoli. This is just going to be a lot slower because you don't have the enzyme. Because what do enzymes do? They speed up the rate of a reaction. So in other words, this one right here is going to be fast. This is going to contribute to a lot of the fast release of CO2. Okay. So we got, we got the 2 comma 3 BPG away from us. We got the protons away from us. We got the CO2 away from us. And we got the oxygen bound on to me. So now this oxygen is in the oxy state or the oxyhemoglobin. So what kind of oxygen is this called? What kind of hemoglobin is this now? Because he's bound to all these oxygens here. He is called oxyhemoglobin. So this guy is called oxyhemoglobin. But you know we have another name for oxyhemoglobin. Oxyhemoglobin is when the hemoglobin is in what's called the R state. The R state according to biochemistry, right? So it's in the relaxed state. And in the relaxed state or the R state, it's highly, has high affinity for oxygen. So in, in, in complete uh, simplification here, what is really happening with this whole external respiration here? Specifically, in this point here, hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen is very low. If hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen is really, really low, what's going to happen? Oxygen is going to have to get loaded onto the hemoglobin. So oxygen gets loaded onto the hemoglobin. So in this step, there's actually going to be oxygen loading. But we don't want to hold on to the CO2 anymore. We don't want to hold on to the protons anymore. And we don't want the 2 comma 3 BPG to keep stabilizing us anymore. So what are we going to unload? We are going to have CO2 and proton unloading. Okay? You know what this effect is called whenever you have oxygen loading onto the hemoglobin, CO2 and protons being unloaded off of the hemoglobin? Special name for this. They call it the Haldane effect. They call this the Haldane effect. And the Haldane effect is just in simple. It's when the hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen switches a little bit. Right? Because before it had, it had a decreased oxygen affinity. But then what started happening? Remember I told you? Oxygen's partial pressure gradient is so steep that oxygen starts moving from the alveoli into the blood. And it starts binding onto the hemoglobin. As it starts binding onto the hemoglobin, what happens to the affinity that hemoglobin has for oxygen? It increases. So in this state, the T state, it has low affinity. But in the R state, what does it have? It has high affinity for oxygen. And what about the affinity for CO2? It has a decreased affinity for CO2 and protons. So in this situation in which there is the gas exchange, where oxygen is going to be loaded onto the hemoglobin, the actual hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen is going to increase. CO2 and protons are being unloaded. So then the hemoglobin's affinity for CO2 and protons starts decreasing. That is, by definition, the Haldane effect. OK, so real quickly, Haldane effect, oxygen is being loaded onto the hemoglobin. CO2 and protons are being unloaded. Originally, hemoglobin's affinity in the T state or the deoxy state was a decreased oxygen affinity and high CO2 proton affinity. But whenever this oxygenation process occurs, then we have oxyhemoglobin. It's now in the R state. So its affinity for oxygen increases because the oxygen is being loaded onto the hemoglobin. But its affinity for CO2 and protons decrease because they are leaving the hemoglobin. When that happens, 
what is the overall definition of this situation? This is called the Haldane effect. And that's kind of encompassing here this whole external respiration process. All right. In this video, we covered a lot of information, guys. I, I thank you guys for sticking in there with me. I hope it all made sense. I hope you guys did enjoy it. In the next video, we'll talk about this same scenario, but occurring in the tissues, with the, between the blood and the tissues, internal respiration. All right, I'll see you guys soon.